you, Drew. Good morning. Uh oh. I have an announcement. Yes. For all of those who have not been to Wagner Glen for the picnic uh, before, um, follow the purple ribbons. Uh. There will be purple ribbons guiding your way through the gate and around you go halfway back and down and around the big circle and just follow follow the purple <laughs> thank you joan if i just knew what purple was that would be great you know they always do this if somebody else puts those ribbons out there that are not purple and i end up going that direction so amen thank you very much uh what a blessing uh, today to be able to start our service with focus on the Lord. And before we do that, uh, it would be remiss if I did not acknowledge Bernie and Norlene with us today over here. So good to have them with us this morning. <clears throat> Amen. Taking a couple turns in their life that they didn't predict or expect and come out on the other side. The Lord is gracious and good all the time. Thanks so much for being with us today. Um, through the ages, there are songs. You may remember when you were younger, church, songs that you heard, and then they just never leave you. They're like kind of your favorite. Even though they may be a bit outdated, they still are your favorite. And it's usually something connected with an experience you had. Uh, at an age or an event of circumstances in your life. And uh, so the song means more to you. And I can remember the first time I heard this song, <clears throat> and I thought to myself, that's scripture. And I like that scripture before I learned the song. As the deer panteth for the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. The psalmist wrote that. He didn't write that in a time of great joy and mountaintop experience but he wrote that in the valley of his life he wrote that when <clears throat> life wasn't the way he had expected it to be and in the, his despair uh, trying to find purpose for life he reminded himself of what he knew to be true because that's what happens sometimes when we go through the adversities of life we lose our perspective of what's true <coughs> and we get smothered by the problem and we lose our perspective. And the psalmist in his despair said, As the deer panteth for the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. He knew that the way to survive the adversity of life was to set his affection on things above and not on things of the earth. To keep his mind on heavenly things. And so he said, I, I, want, I want you, God, just like the deer needs the water, I want you that much. Stand with me if you would. If you've never heard the song, listen to it. We'll sing it a couple times through. And enjoy the words uh, of this great hymn.
on the course again as the deer pants for the water. such a conflict in our life when we sing songs like this because even though in our hearts it's so true we want so much to pant for you as the deer pants for the water Monday comes and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and so many distractions with it we find ourselves really longing after a lot of other things instead of you. And it's always a conflict, Lord. The desire of our heart is this song, but the practice of our life often doesn't reflect the song. I am so glad, Lord, that you are a gracious, loving, and forgiving God. For even when we fail, even when we depart from the very thing that is so real in our hearts, uh, Lord, you're gracious and your understanding. And in gentleness, you bid us to come back. Part of Sundays to me are just this time for restoration. Lord, to bring my focus back to you, to bring my desires back to you, to start another week that I know that through the week I'm going to lose some of that fervor, some of that zeal. And then Sunday will come and it will get me going again. It is the practice of our life that just is so disabilitating. I, I thank you, Lord, for this song, and I thank you for the psalmist who wrote it, and I thank you for the principle. Lord, you know in our hearts this is what we want. We long after you. Help it to be a reality through our working week. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing if you would. In your hymn book, if you like to use hymn book, it's also going to be on the overhead. <clears throat> this great song uh, Revive us again. 295. We'll sing the first stanza only. Sing it out. You only have one stanza. You can just belt it out. Okay? Let's sing together. may be seated. Thank you very much. May God give us the desire of our heart, and that is to be revived. You know what brings revival, don't you? Adversity, not prosperity. <laughs> and in the times of great adversity, that's when we seek for the Lord. It is not the time of great prosperity. We seek the Lord. We don't need him, right? Everything's going good. It is in the depths of our despair that we reach out to him. And we are prime for revival because of all the chaos and all the issues going on in our world. What an opportunity for us.
to bring ourselves back to the Lord who always stands there with open arms and says, come ye that are weak and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. What a joy. Well, now our choir comes the first time this year and with some new members back here. Amen. <laughs> I'm looking for who I'm talking about. Amen. me I was just watching they all turn the pages at the right time I remember when I first came one of the joys I had was watching you turn the pages when no one else was turning them <laughs> 
I thought she has the song memorized. She doesn't have to look at the book. She's turning the pages. Uh, do you remember those days? Yeah, yeah. Now she's all grown up, but back then, you know, she was like down here, everybody else was up here, and she was going back and forth. Uh, oh, what a memory. Have I been here long enough to see you grow up? That's scary, isn't it? You didn't have to agree with me. <laughs> okay, yeah. Amen. Thank you, choir. We always enjoy having them sing and look forward to it. We're going to dismiss the kids to junior church today. Oh, Bob is going to go out. Oh, you already have it covered? Huh? Amen. Great to see the little guys. Look at Caleb over here. I looked at him and I said, Caleb, what happened to you? You know, man, he's grown up. You feel like you've grown up? Yeah. I said, I think you grew 26 inches. And uh, that might have been a little exaggeration, but good to have you with us, Caleb. And I see you too. Uh, I didn't want to exclude you. If you walked in, I about had a heart attack. I was talking to somebody. and uh, But it's good to have you with us guys and uh did you feed him miracle grow or something or what is that man he's eating uh, I, I went through Lowe's the other day and john was with me and uh i after she told me how much it was i said hey, do you have any dishes or anything that he can wash to kind of offset the cost and uh she said no but he can stay around and unload trucks there was 80 pound things of concrete. I said, yes. And I said, can he stay for a month? She goes, well, if he wants to. I said, great. Not only will we make money, but look at all the money we'll save for not the groceries he's going to eat. That guy can eat some food, man. And uh, so I thought, man, it's a winning concept. He's going to make money and we're going to save money. It'd be a good thing. between. But uh, I couldn't convince him to do that. I don't know why. 80 pounds. I think at 80 pounds. 75 was okay, but 80 was just a little bit too much. One of the great songs in our hymn book uh, is found in the early parts of the book, if you like, uh, these great hymns of the faith, and I, I do, they have such a testimony to them. Stand with me if you would. We're saying one stanza, so worship the King, all glorious above. seated thank you he certainly is girded with praise praise the lord for that our scripture today is found in colossians chapter 1 and uh, verse 15 colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 and if you don't know where that is in the bible don't feel bad about using the index that's what the index is for so excited you were able to bring your Bible with you today. That's one of the great joys of the Christian faith, is to be able to carry your Bible with you. And the reason some people don't carry the Bible with them is because they don't know where the books in the Bible are, and they're a little bit embarrassed about that. But I don't want you to ever be embarrassed that you can't find something in the Bible. If I ask you to get a hunting book and show me where something was, you'd probably have to, well, you wouldn't, but other people would have to use a, you know, Ben wouldn't have to use the index, but I'd have to use the index and find my place, and there's nothing shameful about doing that. In the Bible, it's the same thing. At the very front, there is a list of the books of the Bible, and uh, in a church, one of the great joys of church is hearing people's voices blend together and singing. I love it. Even if your voice doesn't blend like everybody else's does, it still is a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen. And I love hearing the singing. Um, one of the problems of being a leader 
of singing is that you sing to lead others and you can't often hear everybody else singing about oh, I just I just love hearing people sing back in the church in uh, Lima where I served for previously to hear I had the privilege Shauna was in the choir and up there and we sang didn't we well, I'll tell you and she introduced a song to us do you remember what the name of that song is nothing ever can nothing ever will and uh, well I tell you that tenor part Stan that tenor part I'd use a stepladder to get to the top notes in that tenor part but boy I don't know if it sounded the same way coming out as I felt that it did but boy it was powerful singing is such a wonderful joy of Christian faith to be able to express in song what you have in your heart and the other thing that joyous about church is hearing the pages of the Bible turn when you announce the text there's just something about that in my mind I have this vision that sometime in the future uh, a regime political regime will restrict our ability to meet like we're meeting here today and eventually ultimately will take away our Bibles from us and our meeting places and all we'll have is the word that we have hidden in our hearts and that we've memorized and I can imagine Beth you and Bruce and me and Brenda and some others in this little house scared to death someone's gonna beat the door down and we're saying okay mom you remember how we do this when we drive around the car and one boy will start a verse that they've memorized we just keep going around this in the car until we run out of verses we memorize that's one of the joys of my life but i can imagine the church in the future being like that that the only bible we have is what we have hidden in our heart and we'll look back at a day when we could have heard the pages turn and now wish we could hear them and there'll be no pages to turn so in the church today, one of the great joys is just to be able to hear those pages turning back and forth of God's word and then hiding it in our heart. I often think to myself, well, how would I contribute to a church like that if I don't have God's word hidden in my heart? It's something to think about. But we're not there yet. We're here. And I love to hear those pages turn. Colossians chapter 1 Beginning in verse number 15, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him I say, whether they be things on earth or in earth, or things in heaven. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. What a wonderful thing. If you look there again at the beginning where it says, who is the image of the invisible God? If you go up to verse 13, the last word in verse 13, it identifies who the who is. And that is his dear son, Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. God. We live, um, as you well know, we live in a land of diversity. There's a mixture, mixture of nationalities a mixture of political persuasions, a mixture of taste, just to name a few. With this diversity also comes a variety of religious beliefs. We are bombarded on every front with distortions and outright denials of the Christian faith. If you look at this slide that's on the overhead, if you've seen this um, figure on the top part of the slide, on the back of someone's bumper. This is the symbols of all these different faiths, and they've made the word coexist, that they want us to get along. But someone didn't get the message. That's the lower part of the screen. There's some that will not allow you to have a different belief. In America, one of the joys that we have is that everybody has the right to freedom of belief. Ben and I are not over across the street 
being ag uh, uh, agitators. Yeah, Ben looks like an agitator. By Just look at that face. Uh, uh, over the Methodist church saying, you got it all wrong. Or we're not over across the other side over here at the Presbyterian church saying, you got it all wrong. We're too busy about having a good time right here. And one of the joys of American life is that we can have diversity and allow people to be different. But the suggestion of coexisting together means that you have people that need to be the belief together. And that can never happen. Because there are certain people that will cut your throat if you don't believe like them. So the idea of coexisting is not about me coexisting with the Methodists and the Presbyterian. I just pick on them because they're on the other side of the corners or the library. I pick all four corners. Okay. Is, it is the freedom of America that we have to allow differences of a belief and to enjoy what we believe without fear of someone cutting our throats or telling us that we can't. We're bombarded on every front with these distortions and outright denials of the Christian faith. Many have responded to this diversity by watering down the truth of the gospel. Just look at this picture and look at what she wrote. An inner light in me was lighted and I was seeing not with my eyes but with a suddenly illumined mind and heart. I saw unity capital U. You know why? You, you know when you put a capital word in the middle of a sentence, you know what that means? Personification. It means it's a person. They're worshiping the unity. As a worldwide spiritual force. You see, when we're in the world today with all of this a distortion and mixture and diversity of religions, what happens is it gets watered down. And it, this phrase here is an illustration. It's filled with New Age language that, which blends Christian words with Eastern religious distortions. And you would be surprised how many Christians read something like this and go, wow, I want to experience that too. But the Holy Spirit is not a spiritual force. He is a person. And the inner light that is in you is a person, the Spirit of Christ. That is the true light, John 1, 8. That's the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And it was Eve that had her mind enlightened. And you see what that got her. It was Satan that said, God does know that the day you eat thereof, you shall know all things. And illumination. So you got to be careful. All these terminologies, they make them sound so Christian, but it really is something distorted from the truth. Completely wrong. In an effort to be more inclusive, they have minimized the areas of disagreement so that the emphasis can be on the things that we hold in common. However, this may sound very noble, but it is really a denial of the truth of the Scripture as we have in front of us in our laps. You say, why are you saying all this? Why are you telling us all this? Because in the city of Colossae, the church was being infiltrated by those who had a distorted faith Remember I said to you before that what happened in Colossae is that it was on a major trade route. And because of that, all these people from all over the globe started infiltrating Colossae. And instead of Colossae changing them, they were changing Colossae. And when it changed the city of Colossae, the people that went to church at the church of Colossians, as we have in our Bible, they began to be changed. And instead of them changing their culture, the culture began to change them. And that's what happened here. They focused their attention on angels and the gaining of unique and special knowledge and blessings 
that other people didn't have. They spent a great deal of time trying to distinguish between the physical and the spiritual realm, like that girl that we had in the picture of that slide where we read her saying. They urged a blending of all religions. Let's find out how we can find agreement on things. They focused on man's efforts. They proclaimed a very secular faith, similar to what we have and are experiencing in our own, own days today. It was interesting as I read through the book of Colossians how Paul approached this. Isn't it interesting how often what we want to do is attack the error? But that's not what Paul did at all. Paul's approach to this problem was very instructive. He does not attack the heresy or the disbelief or the unbelief or the wrong belief, but he emphasizes the truth. He emphasizes the truth. And we can all learn a great deal from this approach. Many in our day know that there is a lot of wrong out there in the spiritual realm, but they just don't know what the truth is to be able to understand what it is that's wrong. In the passage before us this morning that we read, Paul underlines the most important distinctives of the Christian faith. And that is the most important of all of them is the distinctiveness of Jesus himself. And I'd like for you to spend just a few minutes with me this morning considering the distinctiveness of of Jesus Christ. First of all, think with me if you would, as it's revealed to us here in the passage, that he is separate from all others. Separate from all others. Look at verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? During my stay in the military, I was able to take a group tour to a religious uh, temple. And they took us all through that. It was one of those, uh, you know, you get roped into this, you go on a vacation, and they you're in the tour and you all follow the same bus and you go through, none of you have ever been suckered into that, but you know, you go through and you got like cattle, you just follow everybody around. And this was a tourist trap that at the end, after they showed you all these wonderful things, then they'd say, you want to buy this, you want to buy this, you want to buy this, you want to buy this. And people would enter back into, some of you are smiling, you'd enter back into the, into the bus and you got bags on every, you know, all over your arms like that. So I'm never going to be like that. And you become like that. But I, anyway, I went to this, um, uh, this religious temple, and in one of the rooms, there were several pictures on the wall. Uh, underneath the pictures were the names, so that if you didn't recognize the picture, you would know by the name. One of them was Moses. One of them was Jesus. One of them was Muhammad. One was Buddha. One was confused. I mean, Confucius. And, and the founder of the Baha'i faith. They were all there. And they had their names underneath each one of the plaques. And you could look at them. It was kind of interesting. We were told by the guide that took us through there that God had sent many prophets to the world through the years. And one of those prophets was Jesus. And he had a lot of nice things to say about the earthly life and behavior of Jesus as we stood there listening. And then he went on. He said, however, uh, to this group, include myself, he was just one of the many prophets. And then he went on to say, the latest prophet given to us, according to them, was the one of the Baha faith, and that one that the Baha faith was built upon. Now, I knew, as a Christian, what they were telling me was wrong. And I was just a part, I couldn't get that way because there's too many people behind me. I couldn't go that way because there's too many people in front of me. So I was just kind of stuck there in this tour. And I knew it was wrong, but as I looked around, as that guide was talking about these prophets, I noticed all these heads going like this. Now, I'm quiet and reserved. You all know that. And I wouldn't ever, I would never say anything. But I wanted to get up on top of one of those things like this and shout, No! No, Jesus isn't one of them. He is separate. Of none of those prophets that they had on the wall is it said, as it is in verse 15 of our text, who is the image of the invisible God. I hope it didn't scare you when I just tried to climb this pulpit. All right. I was just seeing if that hip's still working. You know, that new bionic hip they stuck into me. And it does, man. That's pretty neat. I just right up there like that. Um, but none of the prophets that were on the plaques, none of them, 
is this set of them, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Paul tells us that Jesus was more than one of the prophets. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Not only that, in other places of the Bible, it isn't just one place he says this, all through the Bible, the, this focus on who he is, that he's separate, is listed for us. In John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, if you look in your Bible there, you'll see it. This is such a wonderful portion of Scripture, John chapter 1, and look at verse number uh, 1 and 2. Uh, I have it written on the overhead there, if you don't have your Bibles with you or you can't find it fast enough. Notice what it says. In the beginning was the Word. Now you may not know this. Some of you probably do. But in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it declares who the Word is. Notice the Word is capitalized, the first letter. Anytime a Word is capitalized in a sentence, it's the name of a person. It's a personification. So the in the beginning was the Word isn't talking about written pages. It's talking about a person. So who is this person, the Word, spoken of in verse 1? In verse 14 it tells us, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You all know John 3.16, right? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So who is the Word? The Word's Jesus. And so here it says in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Do you know why I know this verse is so important? Because a major faith, I'm not going to mention who it is, changes their Bible, that second line down, from the word, word was God, to the word was God. A God. They don't want Jesus to be separate. They want Jesus to be equal with other gods. You know that someone, to add a word, just one letter, A, A God, you know if someone does that, that there is someone on the attack that Jesus is supreme and separate from anybody else. And so John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And to this end, that Jesus is separate from any prophet or anyone, the Bible continues to tell us. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 3, the Bible says this, Who is the image, excuse me, who Jesus, being the brightness of His God's glory, is the express image of His God's person. He is the brightness of God's glory, Jesus, and the image of His Son. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4, we're told again, and this is such a wonderful passage of Scripture, that Jesus is the image of God. Meaning this, that if I want to see God, I'll see Jesus. That they're one and the same. Do you remember what Philip said? Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. He said that to Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said to him? Have I been so long time with you, Philip, and you have known, not known me? His question was, I want to see the Father. I want to see the Father. Jesus said, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so here we have Jesus is separate. He is so separate from anybody else. And the Philippians were instructed. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. It's up on the screen in case you want to watch. Who being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be what? Equal with God. You say, I already know all this stuff. Well, I just want to make sure you do. That when we're talking about all of the diversity in our culture today, and especially within religion, that Jesus is not one of many. He is separate. He is more than anyone else. He is separate from them all. But that's not all. 
in our text that's before us here in Colossians chapter number one, we're told not only that he is separate, but he is supreme. He is supreme. Paul doesn't stop by telling us Jesus is separate and uniquely God in human form. He goes beyond this to emphasize his point. Look at verse 16, the first part of verse 16. For by him were all things created. Jesus is the creator. Look at the passage in, before you. He is the... Uh, sorry, wrong, wrong slide. There you go. Next one. Give me... There we go. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. He's the creator. Think about that. He created all things. And John takes the same uh, subject up when he's writing in John chapter uh, number 1. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse number 3. We read verses 1 and 2. But John chapter 1 verse 3. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that it was made. So, Brooke, if you're not happy, okay, God made him. I mean, it's just, you're stuck. You know, what can you say, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you. <laughs> but everything that's made is made. It's such a, a, a wonderful thing to think about. Of all the prophets in that religious temple, none of these could be said of any of those prophets. He is supreme as a creator. Notice in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. And look at verse number 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. He is supreme as a creator. There is no one besides him. He is the supreme creator. I have often thought as I've read down through Genesis, and I've said this before, but if you come down through there and you read all the things that God created, the six days of creation, and he rested on the seventh, one of the places then where he said, he made the stars also. If you have had occasion over the last week uh, to be outside after dark, and you've looked up into the sky, the sky has been perfect to see the stars up there. And they're just, man, they're all over the place. And I think about those that he made the stars like a PS. Like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, he made the stars also. And uh, we see all the magnificence of each one of those as being sons, like our son. Not sons and daughters, but like the son out there. And God created every one of those things in perfect harmony. You probably don't have this problem, but I, from time to time in my world of harmony, I can't even find my keys. You probably don't have that trouble. Okay. But God has all of the orbits and all the movements in perfect harmony. He created it all. To the kids that are here with us, teenagers, all the rest of them back in the back, don't ever let someone tell you that there was this big bang and after the big bang, these planets got slung out by some big explosion, and then on one of these planets, something happened and it began to swim, and then it decided it wanted to crawl up on the dry land, and it developed some legs in the back, and then said, this isn't too bad, I'm getting sand in my chin, and so it popped out two arms, and the next thing we know is we have this. Don't ever let anybody, I mean, you talk about having faith, that's stupidity. All right. The Bible declares the truth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You say, I just can't believe something like that. You'd, you'd believe the alternative? I mean, that's crazy. Where did those planets that had this big bang come from? Where, where, where did the water that uh, happened to come, where did that come from? Where did the thing that started swimming in the water come from? No matter where you start, you have to start with, where did that come from? Where did that come? Where did that come from? And before long, you're in some place with a straight jacket on, you know, thinking, <laughs> like, it's because you're about half crazy. I mean, by faith, we say in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's, it is the most 
common sense approach. And who was it that created? It was God that created. When I went back this, uh, for those that don't know, I, I practiced uh, wild roller sports. You know, they used to have these big ski slums. You know, they get up at the top, they'd come down this, and they'd jump up there and do a flip, and then they'd land, and everybody would give you an 8, 7, 10, or something like that. Well, I tried one of those things off a roof this past year, and uh, um, nobody gave me a 10 uh, or a 5 or a 6 or a 3, but I slid off that roof. The slide was wonderful. It was that sudden stop at the end that killed me. And uh, I broke my hip, and I had to have a complete hip replacement. And... Uh, so uh, I went back the first time, you know, I'm this diehard Marine. We bite nails in half, right? So I was, I was bound to determine that the surgeon was going to say, ooh, that guy's really good. So I went back there and I said, let me show you what I can do. You know, I guess, and he goes, man, you're really making progress. That's really good. Three weeks and you can do that? Yeah. I said, wait till you see me the next time. And uh, so I went home, you know, and I'm climbing up and down the stairs. It's like I'm preparing for this uh, uh, mud man or something like that. And uh, I, I went to town. When I went back the next time, I said to him, I said, let me show you what I can do. And I brought that knee all the way up almost to my chest. And he said, stop. And I said, what? I mean, I thought he was going to be impressed, you know. And uh, he said, no, that, that device that we put in there is not built to do that. We can't, and this is what got me. We cannot make a device that works like the hip that God gave you. He said, you'll pop that thing out. And then you won't be raising that knee like that. <laughs> and uh, that was the first time I realized, Beth, that it's not about human effort that will make the recovery. Because there are limits to what I can do. Man, that's not easy for a man to take. I was bound to determine to tell him, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. But uh, when he said that pop out, I remember the last time it, it kind of got popped out by being broken. It was really painful, so I decided not to do that. I'm just saying, God created our bodies and this world in such a fashion that science can't reproduce it and match the integrity and the flexibility and the purpose. I said, well, I'm a runner. I like to run, uh, and, and I'm pretty active. How long is that thing going to last? He said, well, normally about 20 years, but if someone's real active like you, it might not be even 10. And I thought, well, I'm older than 10. And that hip's been working really good for, you know, for 10 years, the one I had. And you can't give me one that's going to last me 10 years? Created. God is the creator, and he made us so unique, and the world so unique. He is supreme. But he's not only supreme as a creator in verse 16, but the last part of verse 16, his created, creation included more than just the creation of the earth. Look at verse 16, if you would, back in Colossians again, verse, uh, chapter number 1. Notice it says in the middle of verse 16, that he, by him all things were created that are in heaven and are in earth. So it's not just the earth, it's the heaven as well. Everything that exists comes by him. He alone is supreme. And then we're given in the last part of verse 16. It's very interesting. Jesus is not only the agent of creation, that is that he did it, but he's the reason for creation. Look at the last part of verse 16. For in him were all things created that are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him, he's the agent of creation. And for him, he's the reason for creation. Lo, you know why you and I were created? To give praise and glory to God. When that surgeon said, we cannot create a device to replace the hip that God gave you. He said, no one could do that but God. He, he is the creator of... And he's supreme because he did it for himself. He wants the reflection of his creation to come back on him. And people will say, when the sun rises up in the morning, look at that beautiful sun. And when it sets at night, have you seen the colors? Look at it setting. 
Only God could do that. You say, you're just making that up. No, the psalmist wrote and Paul quoted from him, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day into day they utter speech. His creation speaks of who he is. He is the creator, not just the agent, but the reason for it. But he's not just the creator. When Paul's writing here to the Colossians to try to fix them in all the errors that they have picked up by the people that have moved into their area, he focuses them on the truth that he is not only the creator, but he is also the sustainer. In verse 17, this is what it says. <clears throat> and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the sustainer. Jesus, not only before all things, we are told that by him all things consist. Jesus didn't create the world and then walk away. That would have been easy. There are some people that believe that God uh, created the heaven and the earth and then he just let it kind of do its own thing. And they call that uh, 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 the creation of the earth and then evolution took its toll afterwards. But Jesus is not just the creator, he is the sustainer. I always like this verse, it's over in Proverbs chapter number 8. Proverbs chapter number 8. Uh, I love the Proverbs, there's 30 of them. You can read one proverb every day and every month go through the book of Proverbs. You know what the book of Proverbs is all about? The book of Proverbs is about giving someone wisdom. Andrew's favorite verse. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. A wise man will hear and increase learning. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The Proverbs are loaded with wisdom. If you want to know how to be a wise person in this world, read the Proverbs. And you can do one chapter every day, just a little bit of reading, and go through it one time a month. The book of Proverbs. In 12 months... You could go through the book of Proverbs 12 times. And if you take on that challenge, at the end of one year, you tell me if you're not spiritually wiser than you were when you started. You'll see the life and the world in a different lens than you did before you began. Wisdom. In Proverbs chapter number 8 and verse 29, I always love this verse. It says here about the sustainer of life. It says, when he gave to the sea his decree... I mean, I could just see Jesus, the creator, standing there and saying, I'm going to tell you what you can do and what you cannot do. He's talking to the sea. What did he say to the sea? That the water should not pass his commandment when he appointed the foundations of the earth. God said to the seas, stop right there and don't go any farther. Can you imagine what would happen if the seas just spilled out? Every once in a while we see that through a hurricane or something like that or for floods. Can you imagine if God didn't put a boundary and his hand and his decree upon where the sea could be and where it could not be? God holds it in place for our enjoyment and for his glory. He is the sustainer of life. If he were to take his hands off of us for a minute, we would fall apart. Uh, you know, when you're young, you don't need a doctor, right? And since I'm young, I'll always never need a doctor, right? Is that right, Tom? My last name's Young, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, but as you get older, you need a doctor. And then as you get a little older, are you ahead of me already? You need more than one doctor. As you get a little older, you have to have a list on the refrigerator of all the names of your doctors because the list grows and grows and grows because there's so many things in you that can go wrong. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. If he were to take his hands off of us for a minute, we would fall apart. You say, is Jesus just one of the prophets? No, no, he's separate from all of them. And he is supreme. There are many dead and great prophets. Here's a list of them. I don't know how well you can see them. But look at that slide. All of them are a little bit different. The names are underneath them. 
You know what I thought was interesting about this slide? This has nothing to do with the sermon today for you parents. You may not recognize any of the murals up there, but if you ever want to see some of those murals, just turn on your television Saturday morning for your cartoons. Someone wants your child. Someone wants your child. And they'll do it through entertainment. But many of the figures of those things that are in cartoons on Saturday morning are from this chart right here. And the creators of those cartoons have prayed to their God that he would change the heart and the mind of your child. These are all, I mean, there's many more than this, but this is a chart that I found. You see Jesus is up there on the left-hand side, second row down, all these other different ones. You've got all those. These are the many of the great and dead prophets. But there is only one separate, supreme, and living Jesus. I've inlaid that mural that was on the previous slide on this one. Every one of those in that inlay are dead. And you can go to where their remains are supposed to be. And you can visit that. But if you go to where Jesus was put in the grave, you will find that it is vacated. <laughs> it is empty. And so that you don't think it just happened, above 500 witnesses at one time witness that that grave was empty. He's alive. Jesus is separate and Jesus is supreme. And Paul, when he was talking to these Colossian people, said, I don't want you to ever forget the truth. I'm not going to spend all my time hacking away at all the error. I want to tell you the truth so that you'll understand the error and how wrong it is. There is no God like unto Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you know him? <laughs> Let me ask you a more important question. Does he know you? You know, the Bible says, and I, I'm not doing this to put you on the spot or embarrass you, but the Bible says, many in that day will cry out to me, Father, Father, have I not done many wonderful things in your name? And God will respond, depart from me. I never knew you. Do you know him today? Most importantly, does he know you? You may not be like me. I'm kind of unique in many different ways. Brenda's so tolerant. She already has her wings. <laughs> okay. But... I know the hour and the minute and the day that I asked Christ to be my Savior. It was only because I was flying, so I knew what day it was and I knew what time it was. But that doesn't mean, because I know the time and the day and all this kind of thing, that, that I know Christ my Savior. It's because I call upon the name of the Lord. I confess to Him that I was a sinner. I deserved to die. And face judgment for my sin. And I wanted him. As my savior. And Lord. And that day. Is the day that God knew me. Because I accepted his son. Do you know him? Does he know you? Today. If not. I have good news. And I have to jump through a bunch of hoops. And I have to get baptized a thousand times. till your skin starts wrinkling. You don't have to adjust to some sort of creed or join some sort of church. Uh, you don't have to stand on your right foot for 15 minutes and then on the left for 25. There's nothing like that. Only churches do that kind of stuff. But Jesus made this statement. He said, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Lest you think that saints come to Jesus, it's sinners. They come to Jesus. When I came to Jesus, he didn't get a deal. He got took. 
because I was sinful, a mess, and I had nothing to offer anybody. And Jesus, that's the kind of person that I want. And when I came to him and said, I, I don't have anything I can bring to you to offer except for just my sin and my sorrow. And Jesus said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my righteousness and I'm going to take your sin. And now you can stand in the righteousness of God instead of your own filthy rags. And to this day, I'm a testimony of the grace of God that takes dirty things that are broken and makes them whole and clean. You say, how does that happen? The Bible says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. I am surprised at the churches that I've served in over the years of how many people are regular attenders that have never ever made a personal decision for Jesus Christ. Do you know him today? Does he know you? Is there a time when you've said, I need you, God, as my Lord and my Savior? I acknowledge my sin, and I ask you to be my Savior. If not, this is a great day to do that. I love the song, Come you sinners lost and hopeless, Jesus' blood was shed for thee. You can come to him today if you don't know him. There is no God like unto him. High and lifted up, separate from everyone else, supreme over everyone. And he condescended to sinners like you and me. I don't know where you come from, and I don't know what your background is, but there isn't any logical reason someone would love me that much. That he would get dirty and suffer for me. The Bible even said, for a righteous man, some would dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus made the deal with us. Come just as you are, without one plea. And trust me, and I'll change your life. There's no person in this room who would want to be anywhere around me before I came to Jesus Christ. And I can see in some of the faces of you right now that you've lived right there with me, that you know there wasn't anything attractive about us. But Jesus made the difference. And he gave me hope. Larry, did he give you hope? Did he change your life? He does that. And he'll do that to your life today. You say, I'm too far gone. <laughs> Where sin abounded, the Bible said, grace did much more abound. You cannot get that far away from God. He loves you. And if you cast your care upon him today, he cares for you. And he will be your Lord and your Savior. Do you know him today? Does he know you? Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had today. I am so glad that you are who you are. There may be many of those prophets that were on that screen that it did good things while they were here. I don't know their lives. I know some of the things that are written about some of them are more fantasy than they are truth. But they may have spent some of their life doing good things. But the Bible says all of our goodness or all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Good deeds never do anything for anybody. And I know all of those and the others that followed before and after them all spent their life living as they lived and then died. They could offer no assurance of life beyond death. But Jesus met Mary and Martha and said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then ask the question, believest thou this? Do you believe that? Well, I thank God that I believe that. I thank God I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. There's someone here this morning that doesn't know you or you don't know them. I pray today would be the day they would throw off the religious shackles and traditions of the past and come before you and say, here I am, take me as I am. And they'd make that decision today. I know at 19 years of age, I made that decision. It's the best decision I ever made. I've never, ever, ever regretted ever making that decision. I hope someday someone here today will make that decision too. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me if you would. We sing a closing invitation song, 341 in our hymn book. 341. Lord, I'm coming home. Let's sing this today as a testimony to our good Lord. trust that you will if you're not sure how that works or what that looks like or how to do that all you need to do is say something to me on your way out I would be delighted to take you in the privacy of a room show you from the Bible how you can know Jesus Christ in a real and a personal way it transform your life it give you a purpose for living and I'd love to be able to do that today now we have to go change from our Superman outfits into our picnic outfits and go to Tawana Park. If you're not familiar with where that is, just drive straight down this road till you see Joan with her purple ribbons, okay? And I will follow you since I don't know what purple is. Uh, but we hope that you'll be able to join us today. Lots of fun, lots of food. You can leave whenever you need to. Thanks so much for our visitors that have come today, and so good to have you. I hope I didn't scare you off, and come back and visit with us again. We're going to be dismissed, and then we'll make our way to the park. Father, thank you so much for this day, for your word, and the goodness of God. Bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.